Hello and welcome on The Barricades. This is another edition of our show. My name is Bujan Stanislavski. I'm going to be your host. And with me is Maria Cernat, the co-host of the program. Hello, Maria. Hi. And now to our special guest, Irina Slav. Welcome back to the show, Irina. It's great to have you on. Great to see you again, Bujan. Thanks for having me. All right. So uh, for all of uh, you out there who haven't come across yet Irina's work, she is... Uh, an energy expert, an energy market, energy production, energy uh, consumption expert. And uh, she and this is exactly what we're going to talk about today on our show. Uh, she is an author at oilprice.com and she is also a blogger. She's writing extensively on Substack, irinaslav.substack.com. And uh, let's let's dive straight into, into this chaos global chaos and then to the eastern european corner of that global chaos with uh, which is related to this this mismanagement to say the least i i guess uh with regards to energy supply in europe and uh there is in my opinion is some sort of metaphysical element to the whole thing like you know something utterly irrational something that i just cannot explain using any sort of arguments you know rational arguments arguments with which are related to the material conditions that we live in uh some say that it's ideological obsession some say that it's like like complete detachment uh you know from reality on the part of the political class in europe and uh you know you actually wrote an article and published it on your blog on september 7 where you used the word panic the title of the article is 19 degrees of panic and it's uh it's about like the decision to reduce Reduce the energy consumption to the level that people only heat their apartments, homes, whatever, uh, offices, you know, to uh, to the level of 19 degrees Celsius. Right. And uh, I'd like to begin by uh, by by perhaps asking you why why do you think it's a sign of panic? What, what is so panicky about it? I mean, many people are just going to say, well, you know, they're decreasing it because obviously there are deficits of of uh, energy resources, most notably gas. But then, you know, why? Is it, is it really panic? Is it really uh, an, a, an act of desperation? I think it's panic, yes, because uh, it's just one one of several measures that the European Union is considering uh, as a way of coping with this winter because energy bills are through the roof for businesses <clears throat> and for households uh, alike. People are worried that they won't be able to pay their bills. So to cope with all, uh, with all that, uh, European governments and the administration in Brussels uh, is thinking about making uh, electricity consumption cuts obligatory. Mm. It started voluntary uh, last month when they were discussing measures of coping with the uh, energy scarcity. Now they want to make them obligatory. If that's not panic, I don't know what is, because if you tell people that they will be obliged to consume less energy than they are used to consuming, how do you think people would react? They'll take to the streets. They're already taking to the streets. And it's not even October yet. Heating season has not even started yet. And people are already being angry. Mm. Uh, uh, and then they are also planning a direct intervention into electricity markets in Europe, which is um, which are markets that uh, the European Union uh, nurtured and built itself. And they were really, uh, you know, banking on these markets they were saying we don't need long-term supply contracts with the uh, gasprom we'd rather develop our spot market so we can have diversification of supplies but interestingly now that this diversification of supplies has become vital pretty much literally vital for the survival of the european union and the european economy it's not enough yeah, I think I, I I mean I agree with you, and I also I mean view it as a sign of panic, but also as a sign of incompetence in a way. Like, oh, how yes. could you have not foreseen this? Exactly, I know. You know, I this know. is this is so amazing. Like, uh, and and sometimes I just tend to ask myself, how come there is no, you know, violent revolutions throughout Europe? Especially, you know, last time when I heard that you know they're actually going to discuss, or they may be they may be in discussions already in a sense that I haven't followed up uh, on this topic, but. You know they were going to buy uh, gas, like the uh, European Union. I mean, the Western countries. They're going to buy. They're going to be buying gas from China, which is obviously they are buying gas from China. Uh, they were already LNG buying from it. China. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but but this is Russian gas. I mean, China doesn't. I know. Have gas. I, yeah. So I mean, this is so ridiculous. You know, on its face, like you, you know, yeah. this is not mismanagement. This is not. This is you know, th th there's not nothing political about this. Is just such a bad deal on its face. It's a and, bad deal. It's complacency. To yeah. me, it's complacency because uh, the European Union was 
really, really certain that Russia will not uh, retaliate for sanctions, that Russia will keep pumping gas and uh, sending oil to Europe because it needs Europe more than Europe needs Russian gas and oil. Well, think again, because clearly this is not the case. Russia is sending uh, LNG to China and China is then reselling this LNG to Europe because it will uh, fetch a higher price. And uh, now when the oil embargo against Russia comes into effect, China and India will be selling to Europe uh, fuels produced from, guess what, Russian crude oil. Yeah. But the embargo will be in force and the European Union uh, you know, leaders will tap themselves uh, on their backs because they're so successful with their sanctions. But, but it's in all the... fiction. It's all fiction. It's I, not true. I yeah. know, but... Uh, <laughs> And I'm sure they are, they are aware of all this. But if it doesn't come directly from Russia, it must be okay. You see, it's all about the image. But I, I think uh, a lot of people and a growing number of people are beginning to wake up to yeah. the realities that, I mean, who cares yeah. about the image if you're still buying Russian fuels, even if you buy them from China? Yeah, no, at, at yes. a higher price, right? I mean, at a higher the, price. Like we best. seem, we seem yes. to really have become hostages of this PR thinking. Like you know, marketing became everything. Yes. Like it's sort of you know replaced reality for those people there. You know, up there on on the whatever decision making levels, right? In the European Union, it doesn't matter like what the facts are. The thing is how how we are able to sell it to the public, exactly. and what kind of PR stunt we can stage, what kind of theater we can play now. Right. But you're, you're right. And I think people are starting to see through that and are just getting, you know, fed up with the whole thing. We're going to see how things are going to go. But, you, you know, things are definitely not. I mean, the whole the whole endeavor isn't going to go down well in a sense that, you know, uh, we spoke off camera before we started recording it that, you know, I had this feeling that the, the kind of the critical moment we're in right now, we're not going to be in in September, but we're going to be in that we're going to hit that that level of, of of crisis sometime in at the end of November or I don't know in the middle of November not now yes, and yes, it's September and they're already yeah. you know talking about all those things like reversing totally their policy vis-a-vis -vis mm. the energy market they're talking about caps you know price caps which is something that I'd like you to elaborate on as well but you know vis-a-vis -vis the Nord Stream <laughs> 1 situation uh, and perhaps uh, let it let this be my next question guys what are you going to cap you have no gas <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is that that, that was, was also shocking for me. I mean, there is no gas, so what's well, the point? Can... Of... Uh, uh, again, they they keep uh, they really uh, the politicians do not really have a good move here. I mean, mm -hmm. if they say we were wrong, we should have thought our sanctions a little bit better before we started imposing them. It's over for them. Mm. Uh, they're already falling, uh, you know, uh, the Italian elections are coming and the the outlook is not good for the, the incumbents. Mm. Uh, in Sweden, the uh, uh, right-wing party won the elections. I wonder why. This is going to happen in more and more countries because really uh, you can tell people, okay, well, let's try to be a bit patient let's uh, try and help uh, ukraine by consuming less energy i don't know how that helps ukraine but that's a, an entirely different topic but now they're making these cuts obligatory they are at the same time it's really interesting on the one hand uh, they're telling people to consume less energy on the other hand governments throughout the eu are capping the prices of electricity for households which normally motivates more consumption yeah. so you're trying to make me consume less energy but then you go and make it cheaper well relatively speaking cheaper yeah yeah but, but yeah, it's, it's... I, I just want to intervene here and ask you now one important thing because i think into this fog of war we don't see the bigger picture and the bigger picture is that this problem started long before we had the war Absolutely. i mean uh, unfortunately i don't know how is it especially in romania we've been talked uh, we spoke a little bit before that we had this protection in a sense that Romania being such a poor country, we have we have to have these protections in terms of capping energy prices because otherwise it would have been impossible to, to pay your bills. Yes. And now they um, in 2020, 20 and 21, 
they sold this dream of the free energy market as the source, the, the certain source of cheap energy bills. And guess what? It didn't happen. So that happened, especially in Romania, but we seem to forget long before we had this discussion about the war. So I find it so hypocritical to, to focus only on the war when there is a deeper problem, and that is the problem with the free market in energy and not to have long-term contracts, but the spot market. And I right. wanted to elaborate a little bit on that because people seem to be so focused on Ukraine and what's going on that they tend to forget the bigger picture here and the bigger problem. Yes, because it's the big news. Well, you're absolutely right. The problems date far back. They, uh, they take back to the time when the European Union decided to develop this uh, uh, liberalized spot market for energy, which will be good for everybody because everybody will have cheaper energy. And I, I forget who it was. Uh, was it? I think it was the Belgian prime minister who just earlier this month said the, the free market uh, worked very efficiently until it stopped working. Those yeah, was, so were his I was healthy words. until I wasn't, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was healthy until I got sick. I wonder why. Probably yeah. because I don't live a healthy life. Yeah. But yes, liberalized market was sold as a panacea for cheap energy, for affordable energy. Uh, and, and by the way, my husband is Romanian and he has been against this liberalization from the start and he's been very vocal about it and very unhappy that this liberalized market involved uh, Romania being basically obliged to sell some of this gas of its gas on this uh, on the wider European market instead of first making sure that its own population has uh, enough energy supply. And it's not just uh, Romania, it's every country in Europe that has an independent or its own uh, source of energy and does not depend so much on imports of energy as, for example, a random example, Germany. And this is why uh, there is, I'm probably jumping to, to a different aspect of the crisis, but uh, there is no real unity in the European Union as regards these uh, measures on no but, but obviously the there is I, I actually you wrote that in one of your perhaps it's even the most recent article about solidarity or the lack of solidarity yes, and the kind of yes. breakdown in general and that this is all fantasy that there is some kind of solidarity it's like mutual networks of exploitation you know within the european union <laughs> and i well, think uh, yeah and i think it really I, I mean when you because we're going to talk about eastern europe a little bit more but you know before we before we get to to you know to this place you know this kind of specific corner of the european union a specific corner of this global chaos uh with regards to the energy policy i still want to want you to to perhaps elaborate a little bit on the general situation especially vis-a-vis -vis nord stream one because you know we uh we thought or they they thought that you know Russia will keep sending oil, will keep sending you know gas, will keep sending whatever coal you know, oh, and yeah. and will pressure uh, the European governments or maybe will try to bribe some European governments uh, you know into not embargoing Russia you know vis-a-vis -vis all those uh, energy sources. But this turned out to be a completely, you know, false uh, sort of prediction in a sense that, you know, Russia and many experts have said that, by the way, that, you know, like, where where are you getting this from? That Russia has to sell all its gas or whatever amount of gas or other energy sources to Europe. Why, why do you think you're so special that if you're not there, then there isn't going to be anyone else on the other end of the trade line uh, to buy that. And it turns out that now we have China buying that and then we are buying it from China and all the rest of it. So this is just such a such a major miscalculation, such a bad deal, such a horrible plan, if there were any plan whatsoever. Oh, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so so I want I want to ask now, do you do you see do you uh, uh, how do you interpret this move on the part of Russia? I mean, obviously, there is an element of retaliation. But then the question is, what you know? Okay, they turned off Nord Stream One. Do you think they they just want to troll Europe and they want to you know start sending <laughs> gas through Nord Stream Two just to make sure that you know? <laughs> uh, there was there was an argument to 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 this uh, to this tune that uh, Russia actually wants Germany to to open Nord Stream Two, but uh, I'm not so sure. It could have been part of the plan because they said uh, pretty directly. We don't have the turbines for Nord Stream 1, but there's a brand new pipeline, Nord Stream 2. Open that and we'll ship, uh, you know, we'll send gas uh, uh, via this pipeline. 
but uh, obviously Germany couldn't afford this. I mean, it will be a slap in its own face, so it uh, it didn't allow it. So um, Russia cut all flows, citing mm. technical difficulties. Some were really entertained by this decision, others weren't as entertained, but let's face it, uh, uh, Nord Stream 1 was running at 20% of capacity. And apparently, judging by the reaction of the European Union to the suspension of total flaws at uh, the reaction of, of the market, even these uh, 20% of flaws was really important for Europe. Mm. And now it's gone and Europe is only getting uh, Russian gas via Ukraine and via Turk Stream, and that's it. And Russia can also turn that off whenever it wants to. Right, right. Okay, so uh, since you mentioned this this Turkish Greek, uh, you know, pipeline, like in in south uh, uh, southeastern Europe, let's let's speak briefly about uh, Bulgaria, the country that we're both from, by the way. Uh, you know, Bulgaria planned to purchase this this uh, morally politically correct gas from Azerbaijan, and uh, you know, I I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what actually happened, what occurred. Uh, like, what about the pipeline? You know, that passes through Greece. Uh, right. wh why is it still not working? Why uh, are the uh, Bulgarian authorities looking for ways to politely speak to Gazprom again? Uh, you know, what's what's happening there? What were the expectations? Uh, what was what was the reality check? And what are what's the current uh, situation? Right. It's all about this interconnector that will bring uh, Azeri gas via the southern gas corridor to Bulgaria. Mm. I don't know how morally correct it is right now. I mean, following the the latest events uh, from Azerbaijan and Armenia. Of course. But yeah. let's say it's a little less immoral. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's uh, this uh, this interconnector that was supposed to be operational last year, I think. Oh, 2018, first time I heard, I think. Really? I yeah, don't I think remember the that first time it was like 2018. Really? They said, it's going to be done in a few months, you know, we're going to be... Yeah, and that's what the last prime minister was saying. Yeah. It will be operational in June. Well, it wasn't operational in June. Now the caretaker government says that they went and did an inspection uh, on site. Everything uh, appears to be done and it should be operational from October. Mm. I won't hold my breath, but maybe somebody pressed somebody else into doing their job. You know how things happen on the Balkans. It's just the way it is. It has always been this way, much as we uh, try to do things in a more you know, organized and more schedule uh, compliant way since we've been members yeah but let's let's just assume Union. for a while that they're right let's just assume for a while that they're actually going to get this Azerbaijani gas which is as you said i mean what kind of mm -hmm. moral correctness is it when you know because we were supposed not to import gas from russia because russia is like authoritarian and is invading neighbor neighboring countries as if azerbaijan is like you know this oasis of democracy somehow <laughs> in, know, in, in central know. asia you know and of course you know they don't carry out wars and stuff like that so so this is uh let's just you know put it uh uh away because like we, we could be laughing at it like for the next 20 minutes or yeah. so but but you know what like let's just assume they're going to fix this interconnector whatever you know the, the kind of thing that they need there and technically speaking the uh flow of azerbaijani gas is going to be made you know is going to be made possible the question is is it going to be enough i mean does azerbaijan have enough do they have enough gas and considering that there are all the countries you know all around europe and the world maybe i don't know like you know i haven't followed up on this topic but the thing is i don't know how many people are in line for this <laughs> for, for this gas from azerbaijan because you know we have had for example in poland we're going to speak about poland maybe a little later but in Poland, they are counting on the Norwegian gas, and they have been counting on Baltic pipe for, I don't know, uh, uh, say, last five weeks, six weeks, something like that. And they kept saying every day that they're going to open it tomorrow, they're going to sign the gas contract tomorrow. Not, none of this has happened so far. So I'm wondering, like, okay, let's just assume it's there. Let's just, you know, the gas is flowing. Is there going to be enough gas for Bulgaria? Because Bulgaria is not such an important country, really. Yeah, there exactly. are more important countries with more, with more right. power to pressure you know, uh, be the Azerbaijani authorities or anyone else, uh, you know, on the way for that matter, to give gas, to, to, to sell them gas first, right? Yes, but uh, it depends on the pipeline network. And the pipeline network from Azerbaijan does not go as far as, for example, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the southern gas cor corridor, which uh, ends in Italy, in the Trans-Adriatic mm -hmm. Pipeline. 
So that's the, the final point. It, the gas can't go any further than Italy, uh, unless there are more pipelines to, to take it to, to Northern Europe. But Bulgaria is not very important uh, global player, but it's also, luckily for us, it's not a very large gas uh, consumer. It consumes about 3 billion cubic meters per year, and Azerbaijan has committed, we, we have a contract, I think, I'm pretty sure we do have a contract, for a third of that to be supplied by Azerbaijan. And recently, uh, Azerbaijan has said that they could supply uh, double that amount. Mm -hmm. And here's a joke, at least to me, it's a joke. Uh, our uh, economy minister was recently uh, on a visit uh, in Azerbaijan, and he proposed that we export electricity to Azerbaijan, and... Uh, they pay us in natural gas. The logic being that Azerbaijan is currently generating all of its electricity using natural gas. And they will save some of that gas if they receive imports of electricity. And now we should all look at a map to see exactly how far Bulgaria is from Azerbaijan. And, you know, this is a joke. We can export electricity to Azerbaijan. But right. if they say they can double the, the amounts they can sell us of natural gas, then that's fine. They know okay, best so, how much gas okay. they have. But do you think do you think that Bulgaria is on the safe side in that case? Uh, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, Which it's is great that we, quite we paradoxical. don't... paradoxical. <laughs> uh, yeah. Who would have thought that, uh, you know, the poorest members of the European Union, like Bulgaria and Romania, might be actually better positioned in this crisis, Bulgaria, because it's really a, a miniature consumer of natural gas, and it doesn't use most of it to uh, generate electricity for most of the country. Luckily, we have our nuclear power plants, mm. and we have our coal power plants, and Romania has its own uh, gas production, even if it's not enough to supply the country, but it does have its own energy supply, which mm. puts us on a... On a <laughs> And also no, our, but our... it doesn't put us on a very good position if we are forced to play on this European energy market that actually oh, absolutely. Export. Yeah. And let me see if I get it correctly. Now, if you play um, on the European energy market, then you have to put the one that is able to buy from you. So the best buyer above the interests of Romanians, right? So if you're an energy trader and somebody in the European market offers you that price, you have to sell it, even if Romanians are freezing in your country. Am I right? Uh, I'm not sure. I think there should be legislative guarantees that, uh, you know, oblige the government to first ensure there will be enough energy for the population of this country before exporting. But I'm not sure that, that there must be guarantees. But, but how good then... these guarantees are is a, a totally different question. What you say makes perfect sense. Yes, they're, they're traders, they trade, they, they're they in the business to make a profit. So they will uh, export electricity, even if they, which is what, uh, sorry, uh, which is what Norway did. It subsidized, uh, the electricity bills of Norwegians so it can export more electricity to Europe because it was fetching higher prices. Yeah, so this is, uh, I really want to get to this part because uh, Romania of all countries in the European Union seem to be for the first time disobedient. And um, it was a week ago that the Romanian government suggested some regulations that came into direct conflict with the energy traders in Europe, saying that they will no longer provide um, um, compensations um, if the energy prices go higher, goes higher than 250 euros right. per kilowatt. So this is an indirect way of capping the price saying mm -hmm. we will compensate, but this is our limit. We cannot compensate if the kilowatt uh, is, is uh, sold. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, 700 euros in one day on the spot market. And then they said it's simply impossible. It will uh, make everything implode in Romania. Uh, and they also said we will compensate the users that uh, consume less than 250, 
I think kilowatts per month or so there is a cap also on consumption. So they are trying to really keep things uh, in control. And it was yesterday that the um, Association of European Energy Traders sent a quite threatening letter to the government saying that this ordinance that was approved last week should be repelled immediately because it will lead to the destructuring of the free energy market. Because another thing of that ordinance was the following. Those who want to trade and export energy from Romania on the European energy market will be taxed with 100% of their profit. Wow. Because this was also an indirect way of making sure that Romanians are, come, come first when it comes to energy. Because right. Romania is quite independent energetically, but if you throw Romania on the energy market mm -hmm. and you, you uh, open the possibility for trade on the energy market in the European Union, then the Romanians will be in the position of competing with other citizens in the European Union that earn five or six times more than our citizens, isn't it? So this was uh, the, the thing that it was not very clear that you had a regulation to make sure that your citizens are fine before exporting your energy. And I want you to comment on this. How is this going to destructure? Yes, what? <laughs> Romania is going to destructure the, the European uh, energy Who would have market. thought? Who would have thought, isn't it? <laughs> because we are number one in terms of obedience in general. No, we're number one. <laughs> I will give you number two, but Bulgaria okay. has been a, a lot more obedient. Um, well, it's it, it's interesting, this situation, because what the uh, Romanian government seems to be doing is exactly the same what other uh, European governments and Brussels are also doing direct intervention into markets. But in this case, uh, the, the intervention uh, by, by Brussels aims to help uh, energy traders cover their losses suffered uh, because of the uh, energy price spike. What Romania is trying to do, uh, I, I believe, is to really protect the people who might not be able to pay their bills if energy traders are allowed to export everything they can because prices are uh, higher on the uh, on the European market. Uh, so uh, I suppose energy traders are uh, threatening with the disintegration of the energy market uh, because it is uh, it's government regulation is a threat to their profits. But they will be fleeced by the government anyway because this is uh, another thing the European Union is discussing right now, uh, imposing windfall profits on energy utilities and energy players but mostly utilities that do not use natural gas mm -hmm. so one so way or another they're going to protect the profits of the big energy companies one way or another right yeah yeah i think so they're bailing out the traders now that we're talking about it it becomes clear in my mind as well they're going to bail out the energy uh, traders but punish ironically the companies that are uh, you know using anything other than gas to produce electricity and are making profits because electricity is uh, is expensive. And just the news of this government intervention into the European electricity market has led to a sharp plunge in gas prices and electricity prices. How mm -hmm. significant is that? Just the promise of direct intervention immediately pushes prices down, which makes one wonder how much of the problem is due to speculation of the sort that uh, Maria exactly. talked about. But I believe I a lot ask, of it is speculation, actually. And I also have a, 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 something that I really want to find out from you, because to me is not clear. I mean, in Romania, this energy providers, these energy traders are being portrayed as the heroes of capitalism, as the entrepreneurs, heroes that are uh, perfect for the economy. And to me, it, it's so bizarre. I, I just don't understand this. So you have publicly owned companies producing energy, right? Because all 
but all energy in Romania is produced by state-owned companies. Then you have these people, right, that are the energy providers and traders, and then you have the consumer. Well, would it be easy to get them out this middleman <laughs> from the picture? <laughs> it I mean, would be, it would be, but it wouldn't be capitalistic. You know. But uh, what entities are these people? Tell, tell us a little bit about these uh, people. Who are they? Uh, how uh, they oh my gosh. so influential? I, I, I'm really not. Uh, I'm really not. Uh, uh, I'm not that intimately familiar with how uh, the energy markets, this financial markets, operate because I, I'm not a trader. I will never be a trader. You know, I just observe uh, from the the side, but. Uh, uh, effectively, I think they're middlemen, as the same kind of middlemen that uh, exist in every other industry. And the point of the middlemen is to, uh, you know, facilitate trade between buyer and seller. And I expect this is, uh, basically speaking, this is the reason for their existence. And when you have such uh, a liberalized market as the European electricity market, uh, the, the possibilities are endless uh, until they're not, mm. <laughs> to paraphrase the Belgian prime minister. Uh, yeah. it, it's all fun and games uh, until gas prices hit records, basically. But uh, you're right. If uh, How are your state-owned energy companies not privatized yet, by the way? I mean, we well, privatized tried... everything we could. Well, they tried, but unfortunately, because also the the national electricity grid and everything needs huge investments, and mm -hmm. they are not profitable. And it seems All it's right. very hard to make a profit uh, because you still have to invest, you still have to pay a lot of people. So, and there is also another thing: corruption. Meaning, oh, of course, a lot of people are that are. Um, 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 how, how should this are sponsoring political parties in Romania are put in the administrative councils of these uh, state-owned companies. So let's say uh, I want to donate to the Social Democrats. They put me in the um, administration council of the energy, you know, power plant producer. And then I will receive a huge salary, like 12,000, 15,000 euros, which for Romania is simply huge. I will keep some for myself and I will donate to the party. This is the, the system. Right. And this is actually corruption and this type of corruption that preventing the, the privatization of this. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. such a, you know, interesting landscape. Yeah, I, I very I don't, don't want to. I, like I don't want to give ideas, you know, to your people. But in, in Bulgaria, we kind of privatized it. But the investments are still, you know, uh, I, I mean, when the private companies want to invest or need to invest into something, they call the state. So they get then they get some <laughs> subsidies and they use it for investments. So basically, one way or another, things are great for, uh, you know, the the capitalists, like the big ones and the petty ones, and like you know, throughout. Uh, the entire spectrum of like trading energy and so on and so forth. But guys, uh, because it seems like, you know, the, the Balkans are pretty much on the safe side because of this pipeline, uh, you know, Greece, Turkey, Azerbaijan, and so on and so forth. So it seems like, you know, we're we're probably not going to be freezing. Perhaps even Italy isn't going to be freezing. Although from what I gather, this this uh, 19 degrees thing that we started our program off with is uh, is actually going to be imposed there or is is the plans are to be, for it to be imposed well, that's there. Well, that's one of the many plans, but uh, I'm sure every Everyone, every country will be made to, uh, you know, reduce consumption in any way they see fit. It's an interesting question how this is going to yeah. be policed, how this is I going agree. to be. Uh, I'm afraid this is just fantasy. Know, I mean, what they're doing is they're fantasizing. They're going to do like the, the way the, the same way they fantasize they're going to take down the Russian government just because they're not they're going to stop buying, you know, oil, gas or whatever yeah. from yeah. them. Yeah. And it didn't happen. And now probably it's, we're going to have another instance of that, like without the Russian government being involved in any way into it. And it, it's just going to be that, OK, let's reduce, you know, and this is the kind of bureaucratic thinking that I can easily imagine is going on in their heads. Uh, you know, in Brussels or, or you know, like in the higher echelons of the, I don't know, German, Belgian, whatever Italian bureaucracy is that, 
okay, so we need to reduce the amount of gas because there are gas def uh, amount of energy consumed because there are deficits of gas, coal, and all, all the rest of it. So we're just going to oblige all the oblige all the countries. We're going to order them, you know, all the countries yeah. or some of the countries to. And then you know, it's up to you. How are you going to carry it out? And obviously, like it's always you know, this way. Too. Like, how, it, it, of course, it doesn't <laughs> work. Like you know, you got to think your face before is you very make. Expressive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's always so, like this. They they make the decision. The commission uh, makes the proposal. The ministers vote. Uh, uh, MPs vote, and then okay, we've decided. Now it's up to each individual member state uh, how to enforce this. Well, yeah, I we can't see it happening here. I mean, yeah. I, I I read about Switzerland that uh, in Switzerland households have smart meters, mm -hmm. and the utility can see. Uh, what temperature they maintain in their houses, which is kind of scary. But luckily, we don't have smart meters here. Mm -hmm. So please come and check my temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I can already see know, the policemen I, I going to, I, I don't know, like villages where with the gypsy population overwhelming how they're going to go there. And, and for example, they're going to measure anything in their house. Like, yeah, you know, this yeah. is just a, such a ridiculous but idea. You know what they, they will do? Because they are devious and perverse, they are going to cut it from that, that because. How do I know this? Well, Ceausescu did it. Exactly. I told you, we are experts. We are experts in this. So guys, we can sell you a lot of tips on how to survive winters when you have no heating. Because as I told you in the 80s and prior to the 80s, uh, Ceausescu took a huge loan for the IMF and then he had the ambition of paying everything back very, very fast. And he did it by uh, cutting our heat. And uh, uh, they used to give us just two or three hours per day of heating. So they can make us, you know, go even lower than 19 degrees. That's exactly what is going to happen because I have been talking about blackouts and, and I thought it was a, a hypothetical situation. But Maria, you're absolutely right because they cannot police us and make sure that we're consuming less. They will just uh, institute blackouts. Mm. which is very dangerous for any government to do, but especially dangerous in, in, in Romania, I believe, and Bulgaria, especially Romania, uh, because there are far too many people who remember the Ceausescu years and the blackouts during these, not years, but decades. Uh, and they should look how Ceausescu ended. Uh, yeah. This yeah. is a cautionary tale, you know. <laughs> it's, a, it's an excellent cautionary tale. Yeah. I, I think a lot of politicians stand to lose their chairs. Yeah. Let's say. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to I'd like to jump now from the Balkans perhaps to another country which is also like going through an absurd process or, or a set of processes with regards to, you know, its energy deficits and all the rest of it, which is Poland, the country that I've lived in for like way over 25 years now. And, you know, recently, uh, and again, we spoke off camera before uh, the recording began with uh, Irina that this is, that it's ridiculous. I mean, people all over the world can see, you know, Polish yeah, poles lining up in front of uh, coal mines oh, coal, to get a yeah, bucket of yeah. coal, you know, <laughs> but, you know, but, but then, which, by the way, is strange in and out of itself because mines in Poland never sold coal you know to 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 individual consumers they've always sold this is ridiculous. Coal to you know markets you know to to and uh, apparently you don't need traders here you buy directly yeah. with the bucket or no you normally would need them had there been coal. yeah but normally you would need uh traders you would need middlemen and all the rest of it you know but, but the thing is that there's no coal which is you know so so absurd like the polish government uh, is is introducing all kinds of measures now or giving all kinds of advice, which I'm going to speak about in a second. But, you know, Poland, there's a debt. Think about it. There's a deficit of coal in Poland, yeah. which should be awash with coal. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, we've got so much coal you know, in the soil that we should be now sort of, you know, exporting making business, it. exporting yeah. it and all the rest yeah. of it. Yeah, but it's also it also has to do with the nature of the thinking of our government because uh they uh, they wanted at one point to to, to be uh, uh, to, to be a bit more friendly to the european union they are of course they have antagonized the european union to the ex to the maximum extent i would say but then you know they thought okay well in in order to to trade to, to trade uh some some kind of um, better uh 
to get to a point where the relations are a bit better, what we're going to do is we're going to close down all our coal mines to pretend we're so green and we're so much in line with your agenda on this. And then perhaps you could do us a favor and not be so picky about our law, uh, rule of law and you know the, right. the judiciary yeah. system dismantlement and stuff like that. So what they did is in order to show off to the European Union, they not only shut down those coal mines, but they kind of, uh, you know, they they technically made them impossible to ever use again like you know now you're not able to use them like in germany for example they've done the the smart thing they just kind of suspended them whereas mm -hmm. in poland they just you know they they flooded them then they you know they they, they would just uh make them absolutely unusable and now well, if we want timing. to extract that coil if we want to extract that coil we'd have to build from scratch you know all those uh all the all smart. those coal mines so it's 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 so ridiculous and you know uh they they even embargoed i made that point on on uh on telegram yesterday because because it was so irritating for me it turns out that now ukraine is going to supply poland with coal ukraine can you even like think about it logically again we have a war-torn country yes, on yeah. which we are relying in poland to send us about 100 tons of, of coal Okay, one hundred thousand tons. Sorry, one hundred thousand tons of. If it if if it ever happens, like you know, for now we only got this Zelensky saying that the Poles are the a brave nation and they deserve to be uh, yeah, supported. You know, beautiful words, but wasn't the richest coal region in the Ukraine the Donbas? Yeah, exactly. That, that's that's exactly. But you're getting technical here. You know, <laughs> this is this is exactly where the questions begin. But but let's even assume. And everybody's cheering, of course. Everybody's so happy that now Zelensky is going to help us. You know, we're going to have this uh, th this kind of um, the winter is basically uh, secured. Uh, yeah, secured because uh, Zelensky is going to give us, uh, the, you know, the Ukrainian coal. But no one is talking about the actual figures. One hundred thousand tons is exactly nothing. <laughs> the deficit here is about five million tons. Five million tons. That's what we're missing at the moment already. So we're talking about Zelensky securing maybe, maybe, you know, if it ever happens, 0 0.02 yeah. of that amount, like one fiftieth. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody's cheering as if the problem was solved. So, like, you know, we're really, we, we've really entered like a new period, a new political season, which is, you know totally metaphysical i mean no one's thinking rationally everybody's just you know cheering occasionally on this or that declaration of this or that politician and everybody's supposed to be subordinate to this like overwhelming idea that you know everything has to be sacrificed for ukraine and you know for yes, the struggle this I, I have fine. a name for this this is anti-russian voluntary freezing <laughs> okay yeah. that's nice <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could just comment on that, like, you know, we have a country, we have a country where people are, you know, we're, which doesn't have coal, although it's sitting on coal, on coal, sorry, then we have, uh, you know, no Russian coal and no Russian gas and no Russian oil, all like total embargo on any Russian, you know, energy source. Then, uh, when it actually came to the you know, when it became a topic here in the public debate in Poland, that guys, okay, well, we've done all those morally correct things, but what about the winter? What about the heating? What about, you know, the industry? Because we actually do need some gas and mm -hmm. coal. And then, you know, they imported a lot of coal from South America, Australia, and somewhere else. It turned out that it doesn't work for the Polish industry in a sense that there's like, I, I don't know the, the chemical the composition. Coal? Yeah, the wrong coal. And they so didn't they know when they ordered it? No, they didn't. They, they didn't check. Okay. Uh, apparently, they thought like, okay, we just have to, you know, we have to cover the deficit. So they bought this coal. Now this coal is just there, piled up without any use. Give it and to the people. Yeah, well, that's exactly what they're what, what they're thinking about. But but you know what they go what, what they what they advise the people to do is to go out into the woods and collect brushwood. That it's like it was an official advice from the Polish prime minister. Like go out and collect. Of course, the branches that had fallen, like the, you should cut trees. But then why when not? It took, no, I no, mean. like I don't know environmental reasons, obviously. Uh, yeah, and, and people and, will hear that and not hear no, to that. But they yeah. did, uh, you know, some people did go to the woods, but then it turns out that the, you know, the problem is that there is not enough firewood for like 40 million people to hit their homes. Really? So, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. then the uh, one of the political leaders here, uh, the most important one, the leader of the currently ruling party, he said during one of his public appearances that we should burn anything. Like everybody's invited to burn anything they like, with the exception of tires. 
if they please, but otherwise anything. And then when someone alerted them that, guys, this is going to produce levels of pollution <laughs> that are unheard of yeah. in Polish history, in modern Polish yeah. history, then they said, well, what of it? We're going to give people, uh, we're going to start giving out uh, anti-smog masks. So like we're on a path to, I don't know where, but like we just had, you know, our political class deciding on advising people to burn whatever they like in their homes, houses, whatever, apartments, maybe even, uh, in oh. order to uh, to keep themselves safe. And then they told them that if pollution rises or if any other disaster happens, for that matter, which they are not able to predict at the moment, they're just going to give out some masks. It's like, uh, yeah, you're going to get cancer, but, you know, we're going to give you Band-Aids. Like, this is, this is pretty much the policies. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, when you, when you hear things like that, what as an energy expert what, what does come to your mind well like, I'm not, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert i write about energy okay. i'm an energy journalist but uh, well you know much more than expert, we do anyway yeah uh, well i don't know uh you know uh sometimes i i just want to to bang my head uh, against the wall because these are people the politicians who govern us these are people who are supposed to be they are there to make life easier in a way for businesses and for households to you know uh, ensure that rules are being implemented and all that but instead they are throwing us into a, a total chaos yeah total chaos and it's because of ideology and because of their own political uh, agenda that has nothing to do with the actual needs uh, of, of the population, including businesses. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you saw uh, Germany's economy minister, uh, Mr. Habeck, who uh, in an interview with the German media said, asked about whether he expected bankruptcies uh, because of the, the price of energy. He said, no, uh, he, he expected some businesses to stop operating for yeah. a little while and then get back this person is an, an economy minister. Yeah, yeah. Now that's total arrogant ignorance. And that's just one example of the what I think is the collective thinking. The collective thinking is, is what really infuriates me on occasion because it seems to be uh, things will happen the way we want them because we want them to happen this way. Yeah. Whatever we do, even if we uh, you know sabotage ourselves at every turn, but others, this is probably counts as a conspiracy theory right now, but uh, some uh, are wondering if it's not a grab for power, if all these uh, market intervention, um, energy consumption cuts are not, uh, in fact, uh, an attempt by European authorities to consolidate power, you know, like... Yeah, which, uh, seems, which uh, seems very logical to me, in, in fact, because, like, on the one hand, they're going to have, of course, the control over the energy market and probably some other markets in, you know, including the food market, probably, because we're going to experience food shortages uh, later on, probably, and all Absolutely. kinds of stuff. Yeah. So this is this is probably going to happen, and this is a way, very good way to sort of keep people subordinate, because you can always turn the plug off, or, I don't know, you can just not give them bread, right? Or, or prevent them from accessing mm. water or whatever, like I'm speculating right now. But this is one thing. And second thing is that it's going to also mean, uh, you know, the kind of war warlike regime is going to also, uh, you know, eradicate a lot of the civic liberties that we're so used to, right, in the mm, European yeah. Union. Yeah. And uh, I think that, that it could lead to some sort of, you know, very strange, bureaucratic, authoritarian, uh, you know, highly ideolog ideologized mm, uh you yeah. know order or disorder i don't know what it's going to be but it does look like uh you know it could it could end in in like we could end in a very very dark place and literally dark because they're going to be blackouts <laughs> but also metaphorically dark because uh we're simply going to have liberalism without that was dark with, humor there yeah, without good. civic without the commitment to civic liberties that's that's what i'm afraid you know uh is is developing uh before our very eyes but then you know when you look at this uh crisis that's uh, developing throughout Europe let's just focus on Europe because America is a bit of a different thing here mm -hmm. but uh, different quality maybe also they've got their own resources and they can exploit certain countries in Latin America so it's it's a little different there but but Europe uh, you know it's uh, when you look at, at Europe today do you think there's any way in this circumstances for for Europe to preserve uh, its 
I don't know, way of existence, economic existence in a way that the German economy is going to become some sort of backwater, probably, because I just don't quite see how they're going to survive unless they really turn on maybe Nord Stream 2 and reverse everything. But those people don't have... Or the nuclear gear. plans, maybe. You know. <laughs> yeah, or maybe their nuclear plants or something like that. Then yeah. France has a lot of nuclear plants, uh, so they can probably survive Belgium as well. I don't know about Britain, where it seems like, you know, I my friends from Great Britain, they tell me that they've never heard of anything like this in their I've lifetime. I've never seen anything yeah. like what's happening in the UK. Honestly, yeah. it's, it's a yeah. horror show. Yeah. But, but then I wonder, like... Uh, is it again going to be like we're going to be kicked worse in Eastern Europe? Because Poland, we spoke about this funny comical things, uh, you know, with regards to coal. But then there's a, there's there's this deficit of gas and two plants, big industrial plants were already mm -hmm. turned off or their production was limited in Poland. The same happened in Slovakia, by the way. Some of them were then, you know, turned back on because it actually happened so that some of the elements that those plants produce are required for uh, the manufacturing of weaponry. So like, I don't know. Oh. Uh, it, it, yeah. But anyway, what I'm trying to say here is that we're already, it's already hitting us. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the price of electricity for our uh, average price for electricity household, Polish households grew by like almost 30%, like year to year. So we can see that it's going to go and then they're, uh, it's going to keep going up. And then they're also counting on gas from Norway, but it's like the gas from Azerbaijan, like there are many people lining up and for the gas from Norway, there are even more people lining up yes, for this. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I just don't quite see how there's going to be enough. Like, I just don't quite it's see. It's not going to be enough. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we're going to probably suffer most because I just don't see how anyone's going to let Poland get their gas before Germany or before Netherlands or before any other country. Exactly. It's uh, this unity and solidarity that uh, the commission is talking about uh, and other European officials are talking about. It's just a face. You know, it's straight from animal farm. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. This mm. has always been the case. And... Uh, Sure, Germany is the biggest economy in Europe. If uh, the German economy falls, every other economy falls. Mm. Uh, from that perspective, indeed, uh, the German economy uh, needs to be put before the Polish or the Bulgarian or the Romanian economy. But from a moral point of view, that's probably not, not exactly too moral. But then Germany is a wealthier country. It can afford more energy in very much the same way that the European Union as a whole has been taking away uh, US LNG from Asian countries who uh, cannot afford the prices that European countries can afford. So mm -hmm. Europe has been getting energy that was supposed to go to, to Asian countries, developing countries, poor countries. So yes, the, the poorer the country, the more it will suffer because that's the way of the world sadly mm. right now so yeah we'll probably we'll probably pay a higher price than yeah but you know i gotta tell you that i feel mm. that the westerners they are really uh i mean we still to a certain sense like in eastern europe we are on the safe side because we've experienced all those things we know about yes. blackouts we know yes, about like yes, yes. You know, hot water we're not being available we're, we're, we're kind of yeah yeah exactly and i just can't quite imagine how all those, you know, snowflakey Westerners are going to be able to, you know, endure this. Because for us, it's like ABC. I remember it from the 90s. Maria remembers it from the 80s. You remember it from probably both of those decades. So, yeah. you know, what I'm trying to say is that, come on, guys. I mean, you cannot impress us with this. You know, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to be able to uh, to get through, but what, we'll what hate kind of you, but you can't scare us. Yeah, but us. What, what kind of exactly? But what kind of shape are you going to be in once the first wave of this crisis hits, and you're going to have to cope with it? I really don't know. I mean, it will um, be interesting to watch. Probably sad too, but uh, yeah, it'll certainly be interesting to watch how how Western Europe copes with that. Yeah, but but I think and and Maria, this is also a question to you, to both of you, really. Do you think we're we're looking into a perspective of uh, you know? disintegration like you know the the kind of disintegration in the sense that now we have this european bureaucracy we have all those networks as i call them the networks of mutual exploitation but <laughs> whatever they are you know they are networks which were put in place and which were polished and developed and you know they were they were they were part of the general architecture of the system that we might like or not but it it was there it was in place and it was functional to some extent 
and the poor oh. were getting poorer, the rich were getting richer, but things were still, it was somehow functional. Whereas now everything seems to be breaking down and perhaps like we're going to be looking exactly at some sort of, you know, gradual disintegr well gradual maybe with a rapid onset i don't know disintegration yeah. of all those networks and a kind of you know fall apart of the entire you know project of united europe like however you want it's to refer to a, it, it's right? a distinct possibility i think or at least it will have to really transform and become something else because countries member member countries will be wanting i expect to defend their own national interests rather than the higher European interests. I exactly. expect this to happen. Yeah. Exactly. And we we are seeing this in work. I mean, for a lot of time, Romanians wanted so much to live like the Westerners. And we admired the West so much. I told you that I read a 800 pages long book written by the last chief of the security services working for Ceausescu. And he won him was so enthusiastic with friends, the wine, the culture, the castles and everything else. So he really bought into that, you know, soft power. And um, uh, he really was in total admiration. So if the head of security services in Romania during Ceausescu time was such an admirer, what about the rest? I mean, everybody was so enthusiastic. But look, now we're at the uh, 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 a point where we can no longer feed people this idea that we must uphold European values, inclusivity, tolerance, multiculturalism, unity, and all the diversity. 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 And we cannot play, you know, that beautiful song with all the nations coming together, the, you know, the European anthem, because now, there is this problem, right? Romania has enough energy for its own citizens. If we are forced by the system to play in the European market, it's very simple. The ones who have more money will buy energy from Romania and the Romanians who have less money will freeze. We'll have a blackout right? and, freeze, and yeah. how long do you think this uh, anti-Russian voluntary freezing will last? I would say until the wrong. until the first actual freeze, I think, because it's <laughs> easy to to speak nobly and generously when it's August, you know, it's thirty degrees outside. But once temperatures go below zero, it will be a lot harder, I think, to defend these noble causes. Yes, and who will come to power in Romania? We have a very interesting uh, political party called Aur that I told you. Boyan about it on numerous occasions that is very weird in a sense that is uh, extreme right wing, almost neo-Nazi, taking Ooh. some elements from the legionnaires and the Iron Guard, but at the same time they admire maybe not Putin himself, but his style and the idea that Putin is the guardian of conservative values and his, uh, you know, fighting with feminists and other vile progressives like the gay uh, community and all the rest. So it's a very weird mixture, you know, that is pro-Putin, but his style, not exactly the person. And they are very popular and they, their popularity is growing day by day. And my assumption is that the Russians are counting on this type of politicians coming to power and toppling the 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 action, the ones leading today, and this is no good news. Yeah, I I, I want to tell you for local very you know uh, voracious voracious capitalists, Romanian ones that are even sometimes more primitive than the global ones. So. There is no good news. Yeah, I, I just want to say here that power. you know I think you're you're kind of um, uh, you're overestimating the potential Russian interest in Romania or any other country in Europe. I mean, judging by what's written, no, in, no, uh, the Russians judging by don't what care is about us. I mean, no, they the... asked at some point. Let me tell you that one yeah. Romanian went to Moscow and they asked a political, you know, economist and expert about Romania. Why does Russia think about Romania? And of course, the journalist, yeah. because she was a lady, said. Uh, 
Romania isn't, uh, you know, discussed much in Russia. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but exactly. But that's that, that, that's precisely what, that's, I, what I want to say. But you... the Romanians, the reverse is not yeah. true, meaning that the Romanians and the, the Russians have a fan club, you know, here. Yeah, the, I mean, the Russians might have a fan club here and there, but uh, the, the overall, uh, I mean, the overarching idea that I want to present here is that it doesn't matter from the Russian point of view. I mean, when you read the Russian it media, is. which I do uh, on the regular, is like... You the, have access it, to Russian news. Oh well, That's with great. a VPN, of course. Oh right. But, but yeah, but but what what I'm trying to say is that uh, you know it's uh, uh, this idea that Russia is like after Europe. This idea that Russia, you know, wants to capture Ukraine, then capture I don't know Poland, and maybe get to Paris or whatever. I don't know. Like it's th those fantasies. Them. But what I'm trying to say is that Russia could care less. I mean, in a sense, they <laughs> they just you know Europe for them is just a small peninsula somewhere there. And, you know, occasionally they look at it and they have a lot of fun uh, looking at it, you know, kind of first watching the, oh, the, the you know, that's the refugees so going back and forth, you know, all those uh, rivers uh, or, or creeks of, I don't know, refugees going back and forth to Germany and other countries and all the problems that, you know, it created and stuff like that. And then now they're looking at the same thing in a sense that, you know, okay, they're going to be freezing to death just because they want to stick it to us as if we care at all. And this is, this is like, for them, it's like looking at a, at a weird scene basically that's that, that that that's all i mean they don't care at all whether someone supports them there or is against them like they just they've crossed it out you know of their list of priorities long time ago but you know i think that what what matters here and the last question that i have for you irina is is this how is this going to be solved because obviously those tough times are coming and mm -hmm. and you know the governments are trying to to do something most of those things aren't very russian that they're doing but uh you know, they will have to employ some sort of propaganda in order to cover it up. So what do you think they're going to be using? I mean, what are they, what leverages, propaganda leverages they're using right now? And how do you think it's going to develop? Like what's going to, what is it, what is the narrative going to be? Like, take a guess, you know, like how are they going to, to, to explain it, to try to explain it to us that right. now we have to freeze, now we have to. I I, I think they, they're going to milk the uh, stand with Ukraine narrative for as long as it uh, works and it might work for a, a while yet. I don't know exactly when it will stop working, but people are already starting to not buy it mm. because really people have functional brains and you can't live on propaganda. Uh, what they're going to, to change it with, replace it with, I really cannot say it will be really interesting, but um, probably it will, it will be something along the lines of we, we have to, we must make this sacrifice to, oh yes, Putin, it's always Putin's fault. So uh, they can expand the narrative from stand with Ukraine to uh, it's Putin's fault. So we must freeze to stick it to Putin. Mm. Nobody in Europe, we are nobody in Europe uh, has an idea that Russia might look on Europe the way you just described. Mm. I, I didn't think uh, about this, but uh, yeah, I, really I you think... may well, very well be right. But yes, we over... Yes. Yeah, we overestimate our own uh, importance for Russia. Russia is out to get us. And I'm sure this will continue to be a big part of the narrative because a lot of Europeans do believe that Russia is out to get us, not just in the Baltics, not just in Poland, not just in, uh, in Bulgaria. It's a, it, it, I think it's a, a remnant from the Cold War thinking. Oh, and previous, and, and even even older than that. I mean, you know, the kind of the, the oh yeah, the old grudges with uh, the UK and France, especially yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Really and also exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But even that won't work for uh, forever because it's not Putin who governs Europe, no. whatever the propaganda says. It's European politicians who make yeah. the decisions, and you can't, you really can't blame Putin for every decision you make. I mean, that will be too much. Well, for as long as the propaganda works, I can. I, I guess you can. But the thing is that propaganda. I think they 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 they're sort. Of, they believe their own propaganda. Number one, yes, and second, they, they believe. Yeah. Uh, they believe that in the strength, they overestimate the strength of it. And you know, being in Poland, having lived in Poland, let's say the last seven years since Law and Justice, this right wing Catholic fundamentalist, not right. neoliberal party, took power, they've only been playing this card, like you know, PR, PR, PR. You know, one hundred and ten percent, and all kinds of campaigns to destabilize the society emotionally in order to you know be in power remain in power and and we can see its limits already now i mean you know they they've shot their all of their uh, they've shot out all of their bullets 
Like, you know, there's nothing else. What are you going to come up with? You know, and, and the same goes for uh, for the European, uh, you know, Western European, if you like, politicians. Okay, we're going to speak against uh, Putin. We're going to speak in favor of Ukraine. We're going to speak in favor or against something or someone else. But like, you know, in the final aftermath, probably some people, maybe most of the people, I don't know, but at least the active minority that takes interest in the public cause, they might start asking the, the question like, okay, Ukraine, Russia, I mean, this is something there, there, you know, in the East somewhere, like, yeah. well, why do we care about it? And and why do we have to freeze, uh, you know, uh, because of their, or why do we have to suffer from that, uh, for that matter? Like, why do we have to suffer, like, from unemployment, for example, which is going to exactly. occur after the uh, industry plants are closed? Uh, why do we have to suffer from, you know, rampant inflation and all that? And, you know, all of this together just makes no sense and is so chaotic and so dangerous and so unpredictable that really I I can't quite see how the our leaders, European leaders, quote unquote, which have demonstrated no leadership quality whatsoever yeah. over the past decades, yeah. how are they going to deal with it? I mean, I can I can think of real leaders, people I don't necessarily agree with politically, but I don't know, people from European history like Charles de Gaulle or Helmut Kohl or Willy Brandt, you know, people who are real, who were real statesmen, right? I mean, they really had a strategy and idea about things and stuff like that. I just- They knew what they were doing, yeah. They knew what they were doing, but even they would have a very, very hard time dealing with a situation like that. And those ignorance, like I just- Well, they put us into these situations. They put themselves into this situation. So now they, they have to somehow claw their way out. Uh, I don't see how it will happen either. Yeah. I really don't don't see a way out, but it will be it will be interesting. That's for yeah, sure. especially that they have no reverse gear. They have no reverse gear because if they had no, you know, thought no, this, like can't. like okay, guys, we've done something really stupid. Let's just get together and try and you know figure it out. Maybe reconciliate no, with Russia never, at least to the extent that we don't freeze during the winter. You, you know, no, but this this isn't going to happen because they are just as you said it yourself. Like they are ideologically somehow obsessed with their. Uh, with whatever notions they have in their head, like yeah. one could guess. Anyway, thank you very much. This has been a fascinating conversation, Irina. Thank you it really has been for a you know the explanations and the insights. And uh, thank you, Maria, and thank you to all our viewers and listeners and our readers. Uh, please don't forget to support the show. Click the like button, the uh, subscribe, like whatever buttons make sense, <laughs> uh, depending on which platform you're watching us at. And also don't forget to check out our uh, website. The barricade online and our to subscribe to our news uh sorry substack newsletter uh at the barricade.substack.com and to the extent you feel you can afford please uh visit our paypal and our patreon pages so that you can make uh a, a one-off donation or a monthly subscription thank you very much all the best, all the best.